Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and this is C++ from Scratch. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be talking about variables. Now, we know from our previous videos that our programs are filled with values, and it would be really convenient if we had a way to assign names to those values that would help us write more expressive code. Now, the way that we do this in C++ is, of course, through variables, right? Variables just allow us to give a value a particular name. So what we're going to be looking at in this video is the basics of how we define variables, how we initialize them, and a bit with how we can play around with them. So let's go ahead and get started. And where we can, of course, start is with a new C++ source file. So we'll create a new file called something like variables.cpp. And inside of that file, we're, we're, of course, going to need a main function, right? The core of all of our C++ programs, where our uh, program begins execution uh, when we run that executable. Now, before we can use a variable, right, the first thing we're going to need to do is define it. So remember, all of our values in C++ have an associated type, right? And all our variable is, our variables are, they're just uh, names for values, right? So our variables are going to need a type as well. So that's what's going to be part of our definition here. Now, on the right-hand side of the screen here, I have the CVP reference for fundamental types. These are just some of the built-in types in C++ that we can use, many of which without having to include anything um, inside of our program. So for example, we have our signed and our unsigned integer types. So things like integers and unsigns and, and longs and you know short signed integers, et cetera, et cetera. We also have things like Boolean types, so true, false, um, our character types, and things like floating point types for things like uh, uh, fractional numbers, right? 32-bit and 64-bit fractional numbers with float and double precision numbers that follow this IEEE 754 format. Okay, so let's go ahead and start off with just creating um, some integer variables here. So the way that we define a variable is by first starting out with the type that we want, so integer in this case. And then we can just give that type a particular name, right? Or, or a name for a variable, rather. So here we have uh, the definition of a variable named var1. So what we're doing is we're telling our compiler, hey, I want an integer, and I'm going to refer to that integer as var1, right? So now later inside of my program, I can use var1, right? Because now our compiler has the context about what var1 is. It's an integer. Okay. So another thing we can of course do is assignment or initialization of this value. So we can do something like var1 is equal to 10, right? So we're, we've given our integer a value here. We've done this assignment. Now, what we've shown here is a little bit of bad practice, right? We've defined our variable in one place and we've initialized it someplace else. In many cases, we want to do definition and uh, uh, initialization of a variable on the same line, right, or at the same place. So something like this, right, we'll go ahead and get rid of that, and we'll say int var1 is equal to 10. So we can do both of those statements in just a single step right here. Now, why is it considered bad practice to have uninitialized variables? Well, you can imagine that you know, when you're writing, you know, somewhat complex applications with many different variables, and you're, say, not, you know, initializing them right away, it can be kind of easy to accidentally use an uninitialized variable. And this could lead to very subtle issues, right, that, 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 that pop up. So in order to prevent these subtle issues from ever having the chance to happen, um, it's generally considered a good practice to um, initialize any of the variables that you create, right? That's, that's, that's just a, a good practice to follow. Okay, so now that we've defined uh, this variable here, so we've asked our compiler for an integer that we're going to call var1, uh, we can create some, some more variables. So we can do something like int uh, var2 is equal to 20, and we can do even something like int var3 is equal to var1 plus var2, right? So we can even set, um, you know, you know, the result of, you know, var1 plus var2, right? We can initialize some other variable using that result. 
So uh, what we're also doing here is, you know, we're not having to, you know, use these immediate values 10 and 20 directly. We can instead use their names right here, var1 and var2. So all of the different operations that we can perform with an integer, the different operators we have available to us, we can use those same operators with these variable names and everything works exactly the same. Essentially var1 and var2, they're just integers. We've just given our integers names. Okay, so now that we've kind of played around with these integers, another thing we can do is, of course, we can print them out. So in the last video, we looked at how we could print things using IO stream and std cout, our character output. So we can do that again with our variables here for these fundamental types. So we can go ahead and include IO stream inside of our program right here. And then right down here, we can say std cout with the less and less than operator for printing. And I can say I want to print whatever var3 is. And I'll also print a new line character afterwards um, so that everything, so we get a new line afterwards. So just like we could print out, you know, an immediate string or single character, or we could print out an immediate value like zero or 10 here, we can also print out, say, our variables, right? Using the name of that variable. Um, okay. So let's go ahead and save this and let's compile this program and run it. So we'll do G on variables.cpp and we'll just create an output executable that we'll call something like variables. So you can see we generated our executable here and we can go ahead and run it. And we get the rather unsurprising result that 10 plus 20 is equal to 30, right? The result of adding our two variables together. Right. Not a terribly surprising result, right? but it shows that everything works as we expect inside of our program. Okay, so let's go ahead and go back into our program and we can play around with maybe some other types. So instead of uh, using our integral data types, right, so our positive or negative whole numbers, we can maybe use our fractional types as well here. right? So, you know, something like our floating point types. So maybe something like a double. So we can make uh, var one a double, var2 a double and var3 a double and instead of using something like 10 we can say use 10.5 instead of 20 we can use 20.7 so we're adding some fractional numbers together right numbers with a, a decimal point in them um, and then you know var3 as well we don't have to update anything here except for the type here so var3 is equal to the sum of these two other doubles here and then uh, a very nice thing here is we don't have to update our print at all, the std cout, right? Um, even though our type has changed for var3, we don't have to change anything about this print, right? Which is pretty nice. So let's go ahead and save this and we'll go ahead and compile uh, variables.cpp again. So remember, um, C++ is a compiled language. If you make a change to the source, we won't see those effects in our executable unless we recompile. So we'll go ahead and recompile variables.cpp and we'll run it and we can see the expected result for now doing this addition of these fractional numbers, right? 10.5 plus 20.7 is 31.2, right? Makes sense. Okay, so one of the final things we're gonna look at is this thing called automatic type deduction. And this really just follows along with the line that, you know, we shouldn't be telling our compiler things that it already knows. It's just kind of a waste of time. So what does our compiler already know about our types right here? Well, it knows that we're saying that var1 is a double because we explicitly wrote double right here, but we're also assigning var1 a double precision floating point type, right? So we're kind of telling our compiler in two places that var1 is a double. The same thing goes for var2 and even the same thing for var3. var3, we're giving the type double right here, and we know that if we add two doubles together, var1 and var2, the result of that is just a double precision floating point number. So we're actually wasting a bit of time here by manually specifying that all of these things are double precision types. Our compiler already knows this information. So instead of manually saying these are doubles, we can say we want to defer that to the compiler. And we do that by using the auto type. And this is how we use a thing called automatic type deduction. And all that really means is we're saying, hey, our compiler's pretty smart. It knows what I what type I meant to use right here. 
So because I'm assigning var1 equal to some double precision number, our compiler is going to figure out that var1 should be a double, the same th thing for var2 and var3 in this case. So we can go ahead and save this and we can go ahead and compile this as well, right? So we'll recompile this and you can see that we get the exact same result as if we were to have specified all those things as doubles. And the same thing goes if we were to use integers here. So if suddenly these look like integers, right? So 10 and 20, right? No decimal points or anything. Suddenly our compiler is going to go, okay, var1, var2, and var3, those are all integers now, right? Because you're assigning these an integer immediate value. So we'll go ahead and save this and we'll recompile and we'll get the exact same result that we got the first time, right? 10 plus 20 is 30, right? So that's a little bit on automatic type deduction. Now, in cases like this, it can seem a bit trivial, right? We're not really saving all that much time here by using something like auto. But auto is actually a very nice thing in this. It can be very nice as this thing called uh, syntactic sugar, a way that makes writing your code um, a whole lot nicer, right? Without changing the actual behavior. So for example, once we start working with things like uh, more complex types, um, so for example, like iterators, right? Instead of having to write out that entire iterator name every single time, um, we can instead just use auto and let our compiler figure out that this thing is supposed to be some complex iterator type. So that's where things like auto can really shine, right? And make our lives a lot easier. Now, one little catch here um, with auto is that it forces us to do initialization and definition at the same time. So for example, we can't do something like auto uh, var, right? right? We have to do initialization as well. And this should make a little bit of intuitive sense here, right? So why is that? Well, we're relying on our compiler to figure out what type this variable should be. And there's just not enough context in this single statement. Auto is just saying, hey, I'm deferring the type to the compiler. And then var is just a name, right? We need initialization as well here, right? So our compiler can figure out what type var1 should be because we're assigning it an int. Same thing with var2, we're assigning it an int. Same thing with var3, we're assigning it the sum of two integers. But our compiler does not have the context for this statement right here. So if we go ahead and quit out of there and try to compile this, we see that our compiler gives us an error. It says, you know, we have some error in our function main, and our error is that we've got a declaration auto var with no initializer. So our compiler requires us to initialize this variable um, when we're defining it because it needs the context to figure out what type var should be. Okay, so that's just a little bit about automatic type deduction. So this was a brief overview of variables and how we can play around with them inside of C++ so we can just use them like we would those original types with all of their associated operators. But that's going to go ahead and do it for today. Of course, down below the video, I'll put a link to this CPP reference file for these fundamental types. And of course, you can find this and any of my other code at github.com slash coffee before arch. But that's going to go ahead and do it for today. As always, I'm Nick. And I hope you have a nice day.